I've got something on my heart for church this morning, and um, it's been a, it's a slow burner. It's something that's been growing for a few months and um, a few lessons learned over a few years, and um, it's it's very unpopular the the subject. Okay, so just everyone look at me quickly and look at this face. Just remember, no matter how you feel about me by the end of the sermon, just remember this face. How could you stay mad? Uh, you know, because what we're going to talk about today is um, the subject of commitment. Oh no, you can almost, everyone's like, can't we talk about fun? Yeah? Can't we talk about love? Yeah? Can't we talk about faith? Can't we talk about hope? We can talk about all these things, and, and, and sometimes they're easier subjects to approach, but I'm telling you, one of the great keys to our lives, one of the great keys to our walk with God is actually this dirty word to a generation, which is the word commitment. Commitment. One of the nicknames for um, the generation that I'm just scraping in, come on, don't laugh at me, I'm a millennial, by about two weeks, and... Um, they call us a few things. One is Generation Snowflake. I don't think that's meant to be complimentary. And another thing they call us is Generation Job Hop, because we keep job hopping, changing, changing, changing. Who here has had a couple of jobs in their life? Come on, honest time. The whole front row, so it's okay, you're safe. Who here has worked with me at McDonald's before? Maybe not in the same store. Is it just me? Yes, come on, this is a safe place. The hand's slowly coming up. It's all right, we got the prayer wall for this, exactly for this thing. And um, I, I worked at McDonald's, that was my first job. Oh, the glory days. And um, it had some benefits, to be fair. We made custom burgers, it was just a thing. Well, I say it was a thing, I did it, I don't know if we were meant to. And um, who's had a quarter pounder? It's good, it's good. Who's had a double quarter pounder before they were kind of outlawed? All right. For those of you who've had quarter pounders, that's great. For those of you who've had double quarter pounders, again, I applaud you. I made a burger which was a double, double quarter pounder, or as I like to call it, just the pounder. And it was quite something. You know, you know you've got yourself a good burger. You know how you wrap it in that paper when one bit of paper isn't enough. That's when you know you're on the right path of burger making. The first layer of paper went completely translucent because of how much fat was in the burger. Come on now. Someone praise him on the Big Mac. No, don't. <laughs> so I've, I've had a few jobs. I've listed a couple of my jobs because I, I, I want to reinforce that I am um, a bit caught up in this generation job hop. So, so here's, here's some job. McDonald's, a lettuce farm and a chicken farm which is interesting because I was thinking about this and I was like, if you take McDonald's, a lettuce farm and a chicken farm, you've pretty much got yourself a McChicken. But that's a coincidence. <laughs> McDonald's, lettuce farm, chicken farm, a kitchen hand, a builder's laborer, a sound and lighting assistant, a decorator, a high school mentor, a real estate agent, a new home designer, a welfare assistant, a new home designer again, personal advisor, contract manager, program manager. I worked in human trafficking and just in case you were wondering, in the stopping human trafficking kind of things, all right? <laughs> I know what you're thinking, don't email me, no, I'm not for. It. All right, there we go. A program director, worked in human trafficking, director of a family charity, and now I'm a pastor. Come on, there we go, that's pretty good. And I can promise you, if you follow my 10-step career path, you too can be a pastor. No, that, that's not a promise. And um, what I discovered, the more I job, job hopped around and tried to find things, I, I was in Maccas and I was like, yeah, I like the free food, but then I saw the lettuce farm job and the reason why I did the lettuce farm job is because it gave me heaps of free time. I used to work from uh, four in the morning till lunchtime and I'd have all the time. So then I was like, well, I've got the free time, but I need the money. So I went, did this. And what I realized is no matter where I job hopped to, no one gave me what I wanted. Hello. Because what I wanted was absolutely everything. I wanted more money, I wanted more time, I wanted more influence, I wanted more holidays, I wanted less work. I had this whole shopping list of things. And whenever I confronted myself with one of those things that didn't fit, I looked around and I thought, is there another choice? Can, is there, can someone else offer me this but with another one of my selections picked? And I find myself guilty, I guess, of being one of these kind of generation job hops. And um, what I've found is I, I was always told that the world is your oyster. Who's heard that saying? 
what does that even mean? What a slimy, gross thing. That, what, the world is your oyster. There's so many choices and we celebrate and we, we encourage, keep, keep your options open. We say, don't, don't, get, don't go too far too soon. We say, keep your options open. You can do anything. You can, and, and we're a generation of people, a few generations of us that believe that we can do anything. And because of that, we will try anything. And, and I found myself reading a study from Stanford University. And the study was, um, it was about choices. This study had a cohort of people who were presented with six varieties of strawberry jam. Still strawberry jam, but six different types. And another cohort of people were presented with 24 strawberry jams. Now, this is, um, this is awesome because this study is talking about this phenomena called choice overload. And what they discovered of, of the research papers online, if you want to check it out, what they discovered is those presented with less options, made quicker decisions, ultimately enjoyed the decision they made and got on with life. On the other side of things, those presented with many, many more options, they had a thing which they described as decision paralysis. They came in, thought, what am I going to do with all this strawberry jam? Took longer to make the decision, and then they had an interesting phenomena, which was after they had made the decision, 90% of those people thought, oh, I wonder if I made the right choice. They all had, or nearly all of them had, dissatisfaction with their choice. We call it something else. We call it FOMO, fear of missing out. They were presented with choices, and they made a choice, and then they thought, oh, I wonder what if that other choice. I wonder what if this is what... One of the great lines in the study says, too much choice is paralyzing. The more options we have, the more we fear we'll make the wrong decision. We're talking in all aspects of life, from careers to politics, where we just don't seem to get attached to anything, any idea, any group, or anyone. That's interesting, isn't it? This idea that we often feel very empowered if we're presented with choice, this study kind of suggests that actually having too much choice can be incredibly paralyzing. Too many choices, too many options, too many ways out, too many ways to go, well, this doesn't suit me, so I'm going to pick that. This has offended me, so I'm going to go there. What I've realized is, in my life, I've always looked up at the top of the career and I thought, I want to get there one day. I want to get to the top but I'm not prepared to climb the mountain. I want to get to the top and live the best family life and have the best kids and and I want to have all the stuff at the top, but I'm not always prepared to climb the mountain. So what we do, we find ourselves saying, well, this career isn't getting me to the summit quick enough, so I'm going to change another one. Well, this isn't meeting me in this way, so I'm going to change another one. And it is risky in careers, but it becomes devastating when you approach your family that way. I want to get to the summit of my marriage, but I'm not prepared to climb the mountain. I want to get to the summit of my walk with God, but I'm not prepared to climb the mountain of devotion time and prayer. It's interesting, hey? Because I remember when I moved to England nearly 10 years ago, I remember saying this statement to myself. I thought I would have achieved more by now. Is it just me? Is there anyone honest here? I thought I would have been married by now. I thought I would have a house by now. I thought my business, my finances, I thought my free time, I thought my family. I thought, I thought that I would have achieved more than I have currently achieved. I may be alone. If I am, then I'm going to really enjoy my own voice today. <laughs> I may have some friends that have said these words. The beauty of commitment is you can take responsibility. When I stood there and I say, I thought I'd have done more by now, what I like to do is I like to look at all the possible things, people, places, circumstances that I can blame. I blame my family, blame my socioeconomic situation, my bank account, I blame 
the fact that I wasn't given that opportunity. It was unfair. I blame you. I, I, I blame my, my other half, not me. It couldn't possibly be. And what we like to do is we say, everyone else has made me not get to where I'm going. And, you know, when we're in church, we blame the devil. Hey, it's your fault that I did this. Like, is it? The beauty and the power of commitment is actually if we grab a hold of what commitment is and how we can outwork commitment in our lives, we can have a moment in the future, not just today, but years to come and say, I'm exactly where I expected to be. I'm not surprised or disappointed because I didn't job hop. I didn't relationship hop. I didn't faith or commitment hop. And by being committed to something means we never have to say again, I thought I would be further than I am today. That's some good news. The scary thing is all our media, all our social media celebrates the moment. I love the moment. I've got kids. You've got to enjoy the moment because after the moment, it's a little thing called cleaning the house. That's life pretty much. Moment, housework. Moment, cleaning. Moment, crying. That's just me, by the way. You've got to enjoy the moment. But you've got to remember that that moment forms part of a minute. That that minute forms part of an hour, that hour forms part of a day, that day forms part of a week, that week forms part of a month, that month a year, that year a decade, that decade a lifetime. Don't underestimate the moment, but don't think the moment is more important than the year. We see people making choices, decisions, choosing this or that based on a moment. I want to encourage you, commitment makes choices, not just based on the moment, but they know that my commitment means my choices will change. I'm going to be committed. I'm going to be committed. Someone say, be committed. Someone say, be committed. That's awesome. Now, I don't want you to laugh, because when I said this in the first service, people laughed at me when I said I went to the gym once. <laughs> Come on, guys. I even warned you. I went to the gym. Um, I'm not trying to show off or anything, but I went to the gym and I worked out really hard. I know what you're thinking. Don't you mean ate out? No, how dare you? I was working out hard. You know when you work out so hard that your legs stop working and you're like... <laughs> and you get to your car and you're like... <laughs> that level. The, the full-on level of working out where your body's like, you can try, but you're going alone, brother. And you're like, oh, no. I was working out, and, and you know, I was, it, it was a bad time for me. I was in the shower in the fetal position just going, no, make it stop. And, and, and then a year later, I looked at myself and I thought, why haven't I got sweet muscles? I worked so hard that day. I did this and everything. My legs weren't working. I, I, why don't I now have muscles? And, 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 you know, it sounds a bit crazy. Who here is a massive fan of dental hygiene? No? This is a tough shout out, that one, isn't it? I brushed my teeth so amazingly one day. Two types of toothpaste, rich, minty lather. Went from firm to medium to soft toothbrush. Electric toothbrush, don't want to show off. It's just the reality of my life. <laughs> floss. Old school floss and those weird little claw flosses that go in. Two types of mouthwash. Walked away. It was like, I was like the poster boy for Colgate. There was so much dental hygiene going on. Then a year later, I went to the dentist. And I had to have like four teeth removed. Why? I don't get it. But I worked so hard. I, did, I'm, I put in so much effort. One of the things that I'm slowly learning, both through my physical and dental activity, is that you can have all the intensity in the world, but intensity does not replace consistency. You can have intense moments of sheer effort and energy across multiple facets of your life, but if you do not have consistency, it will equate to nothing. 
You say, obviously, Paul, you need to do that for your teeth. You need a brush every day. I remember a stage in my life where I had an intense relationship with God, where every Sunday I would come into church, lift my hands, fill out a prayer wall. I, I might even respond to the preacher. I might, even, I might even say hello. I might even serve on a team. But who knows that an intense moment with God is not the same as having a consistent relationship. I've been married 14 years in October. And what I... Thank you. I know, you're really cheering for Aira. I know that. <laughs> Good luck for the rest. You need it. And what I've noticed is if something goes wrong in my relationship, I try and maybe throw a bit of money at it. Let me buy you a notebook and pen. Mm. That doesn't work. So it has to get a little bit more intense. Well, here's... Uh, guinea pig. <laughs> That's probably where I went wrong, to be fair. And it goes up and up. Well, let's go away for a weekend. Here's a massage. Here's a holiday. And before you know it, you're trying to solve a problem with an intense gift where it can only be solved by consistency. An intense act of romance will not save your relationship. An intense encounter with God will not save your walk with God. But consistency will. Consistency will. Cram studying on the night before your exam will not save your academic career, but studying throughout the year will. Hello, the young adults are getting quiet now. Consistency. We celebrate and we reward and we Instagram all the intense moments, but it's the consistent moments which will get you up that mountain, my friend. Consistency. There's three things that I, I, I want you, I want you to be committed to. Just three. It's simple. Write them down. Do something with them. Write them on something somewhere. Here's the first one. Be committed to God. Be committed to God. I love this scripture in Matthew 22, verse 37, and it says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. Love the Lord your God. Be committed to Him. This is what I, I hoped for. When I gave my life and I chose Jesus, it was about 17 years ago, and I made a choice. Of all the choices presented to me, I made a choice and on that day I chose Jesus. I chose to say no to some options and I chose to say yes to Him. What I really hoped for after making that choice to follow Jesus, I was really hoping that all the other choices I had available would disappear. I really hope that somehow, by magic, by miracle, by just some turn of events, that when I chose him, every other option would disappear. But I've got some bad news. When I chose Jesus, every other choice still stayed on the table. I still got to choose every day where and how I lived my life. I got to still have every, poise, every poise choiceable, every choice possible on how I lived with my morals, my ethics, my values. I still got to choose what I said with my mouth, what I thought with my mind, and what I felt in my heart. I still had those choices. They weren't taken from me. When you choose God, and when you choose commitment to God, don't expect your choices to all of a sudden change. But what must change if you are committed to Him is what choices you make. True commitment requires making choices that honor God. Are you committed to Him? Are you committed to Him? Because your boss might give you money. Your relationship might give you affirmation or comfort. Your TV might give you entertainment, but your God will give you life. 
This concept of commitment isn't something that is one way, it's reciprocated. There was a great act of commitment when Jesus, thinking of us in this moment, died for us on a cross. He died because he was committed. Committed to your walk, committed to your choices, committed to you in this moment. He was committed to you so much so that he chose you. He chose you. There were ways out, there were options, there were choices. But at at the end of the day, he said, I'm going to choose you. I choose you. Psalm 37 verse 5 says this, commit your ways to the Lord. Trust also in him and he will do it. Commit your ways to the Lord. Trust also in him. Uh, I love this. I love this because being committed to God means there should be a level of commitment to his church. You can't really have one without the other. You can't really have one without the other. I, I, I think sometimes... We have intense moments and our hands and feet are doing stuff and and we're serving and we're getting involved. But what happens is if it's just your hands and feet, eventually you'll stop doing it. The Bible in James says, show me your faith without deeds. Show me your deeds without faith. They fit together like a hand in a glove. They're meant to be together. But God actually wants to make sure in your heart you're committed. Because the amazing thing happens when your heart becomes committed all of a sudden, out of the abundance of your heart, your life starts to look different. All of a sudden, your hands and your feet start to serve, start to get involved because your heart is changed. We need a heart that is committed to God. Now, one of my jobs was working on a lettuce farm. So I'm about to let you in on some deep farming insights. If you heard us being referred to as, as being the soil and the harvest and the seed and throughout the Bible, Jesus is using illustrations of farming and growing and nurturing and crops and people and often it's about us and him and him and the church. And I, I did some looking into something. I went to farming.com and... Um, What I've realized to be true is there's this concept which is called crop rotation. The Bible talks about as us being planted in his house. And what happens with a plant, if you plant a plant in soil and you let that plant grow, eventually it will get to a point where it stops growing if the soil isn't being looked after. So what they do when they're farming is they have this thing called crop rotation where they'll sow and they'll let it grow, but at the same time, they'll take time out to let the soil heal. They'll make sure that the right kind of nutrients are going into the soil because ultimately it's that soil that their plants, their livelihood, their life is grown upon. So I I started thinking about this and I I looked up this website and here's here's some things that will happen if you don't look after the soil. Are you ready for this? Number one, yields will decrease. If you don't look after the soil, if you don't get involved with serving and making sure that this place ticks over and being involved in the community, if you don't do that, soon you'll start to find that yields will decrease. What do I mean by that? I mean, you might come to church and you might say things like, I didn't get much out of that. You might come to church and you might say, I didn't really like that guy. Did you see his fringe? It's out of control. You might just, some of these little things might start creeping in. You might say things like, I didn't like that song. Well, unless your name's Jesus, Jehovah, God Almighty, we weren't singing to you, so it's okay. (laughs) And what happens if we don't look after what's going into the soil, all of a sudden we'll find that we're actually getting less out of this thing we call church. The second thing that happens is this. Diseases and pests will proliferate. Outside things will come in and begin to eat of the plant. You'll find yourself, if you're not tending the soil of your house, you'll find yourself finding 
and hearing the voices of negative people saying those people are all the same, they don't like you, they're idiots. You'll start to hear these pests, these nuisances, this fear, this doubt. You're not welcome there. They don't accept you. You've got to be like this or like that. And all of a sudden, if you don't look after your soil, you'll find outside voices, outside influences coming in to take away from the plant that is growing. Then you'll find the third thing is weed pressure will increase. Not only will you feel the pressure from the outside coming in, but eventually, if we don't look after the soil in which we're planted, we will find weeds growing. You'll start being the one gossiping. You'll start being the one saying, yeah, they said this, they said that. Yeah, I don't know about this. I don't know about that series. I don't know. They wear skinny jeans. Is that even Christian? You'll find yourself. You'll find yourself with weeds in the soil. And then the fourth thing that happens is this, nutrients will be depleted. You'll start to find that your walk with God begins to slow down, stagnate. It becomes stifled because the soil that you're planted in needs looking after. I want to ask you, are you looking after the soil? It's really, really important to know where you're planted. Because where you're planted will define how high you grow. And I, I, I just pray, wherever you commit to, let it be a place that preaches the gospel, that lifts the name of Jesus, that believes that he's a miracle-working, risen saviour. Let it be that. Let it be that. Go somewhere. Commit somewhere like that. But don't make any mistake. Just as important as where you're planted, you've got to ask the question, what am I doing with where I'm planted? I've got kids in kids' church. Who knows that I'm interested in making sure Kids Church is great. Who knows that I sit in these seats, so I want to make sure our worship is honouring. I want to contribute. I was new here once, so I want to make sure that every new person feels welcome. I was lonely once, so I want to make sure life groups are a thing that people know about because I'm interested. I'm planted. I've got to look after this soil. I guess if you are committed, you, you may want to consider, am I looking after to this, this thing I'm planted into? And maybe you're feeling, well, I don't feel that way. I'll, I'll just encourage you. I would encourage you to consider what commitment could look like for you. What being a part of serving, joining a team, being in a life group. Because I want you to grow but we've got to tend to the soil. Everyone say God. God. Everyone say family. family. Got to be committed to your family. Got to be committed to your family. This is a world where we constantly celebrate the falling of celebrities and relationships. We've got things like Love Island, hello. Where every day we celebrate one person picking someone else over another person and all the scandal that goes along with it. We idolize and we consume this constant celebration of if that one doesn't work out, choose someone else. If that jam doesn't taste good, maybe take another. It's an epidemic. No likey, no lighty. I don't know what that means, it's just on my notes. I want to be committed to my wife, but what about that other strawberry jam? Fear of missing out. The what if. You don't want choice, my friend. You want commitment. You don't want options. You want commitment. I love this, Genesis 29 verse 18. Jacob loved Rachel, and he said, I will serve seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Jacob loved Rachel, so he served seven years. And it felt like seven days. 
There are people here that you're with someone that wouldn't work seven days for you. We've got people who want husbands but aren't prepared to be wives. We've got people who want to be fathers but they're not prepared to raise children. We want people who want to share a house and have sex but don't want to pay bills. We've got people who want the intense moments but aren't prepared to commit. Keep throwing these intense solutions at problems that only consistency can change. You've got to be committed to your family. You've got to be committed to your family. Your, your boss might give you money. But he will give you life. We've got to be committed to your family. Committed, committed, committed to the climbing of the mountain. What does commitment look like for me? Well, I guess 14 years ago, I chose Aira. I made a choice. I said, I choose you. Did that mean, like when I chose God, that all my other choices went away? Uh, there were still many bad choices on the table. Commitment is going home when you feel like you're in love and going home when you feel like you're not. Commitment outlasts butterflies, it outlasts goosebumps, it outlasts feelings. Commitment is not just looking for the shortcut to the summit, it's looking your partner, your wife, your husband in the eye and saying, we're going to do this. When the overdraft is creeping up, when the payments are weighing down, no, I, I don't want to escape. I, we're going to get through this. I may not know how we're going to get up there, but I'm not going to go there without you. You've got to be committed. Committed to your family. Be committed to your family. Be committed to them. We believe in love, but not at the expense of giving up our lifestyles. We want the benefits, but we're not prepared to pray the price. We want to be the CEO of a company, but we're not prepared to work. It's true of relationships. Why can't my kids be awesome kids? Well, maybe you need to spend a little bit more time. Why am I always arguing with my parents? Well, maybe you need to stop arguing and start saying, hey, I, I'm committed to you. I love you. I'm sorry. Let's figure this out. I'm committed to climbing this mountain with you. And the third area that I want you to be committed to, it's be committed to yourself. Be committed to you. Be committed to you. Don't let yourself get away with jumping from option to option, choice to choice, because if you keep doing that, you will find yourself saying, I thought I would have achieved more by now. It takes someone who's committed to themselves to look at every option, every choice available and keep making the same choice. Be committed. If you struggle with commitment, don't expect shortcuts. Don't expect an easy road. Don't think you can jump from here to here to here to here. No, the only way up if you want that summit is to climb. Commit to yourself. I've had conversations with people that I love. And Aya and my wife and I were the young adult pastors here as well at church. And having conversations with people, I'm saying, you can do it. You can make it. You can get through it. You don't need to do that. You don't need to make that choice. It's not over. It's not too late. And then I find myself saying these words. I say, I feel like I'm more committed to you than you are. Don't give up. Don't give up on that dream. Don't give up on that relationship. Don't give up on that breakthrough. Don't give up on your job. Don't give up on your business. Don't give up on your husband. Don't give up on your kids. Don't give up on your parents. Don't give up. What, do you think you could just jump up to the top? You've got to climb. 
Be committed to yourself. If you're waiting for the summit to go on sale, you will be waiting a long time. If you're waiting for a way to get to where you want to go and pay as little as you possibly can, you will never arrive because greatness is never on sale. You want to see any good marriage, every great child, every great business, every genius idea, it was all because they paid an excruciating cost. The summit of your marriage will not be cheap. The summit of your education will not be cheap. The summit of your family life will cost you dearly as you climb. But it is the only way to get there. There is no shortcut. There is no way other than climbing. Commitment. It will never come cheap. Greatness never does. You weren't cheap. The price paid for you was extravagant. The price that you were purchased for was an extravagant price. Don't think that you're not worth it. Don't think that you're not valuable enough, that you've not achieved enough, that you've not ticked enough boxes. That you've not lived the right way. Don't think that that affects your price tag at all because it does not. The price paid for you was Jesus on a cross. He chose you over himself. The most extravagant gift, this gift of life, of forgiveness. There is a promise for you. There is a summit. Don't give up. Don't give up. It's not too late. I want to encourage you. If you've laid down a dream, if you've given up on hope, if you've given up on a loved one or a circumstance or a breakthrough, maybe in your health, maybe in your well-being, if you've given up, don't give up. We may not be able to get there straight away to the summer, but we can keep on climbing. We can stay committed. I think of David and Goliath. He didn't have the right gear. He wasn't the right build. He wasn't the right size. He didn't have the right upbringing, but he still had a mountain to climb. Don't give up. Think about the walls of Jericho in Joshua 6. It wasn't one intense moment that brought down those walls. There's a group of people bought praise and they walked around. They walked around this giant fortress, this mountain, said, we're going to get there. Imagine they gave up after the first time. They said, it's not working. What are my options? What's my way out here? Where's the fine print? What's the other? Is there another place we can go? Seven times they worked. They walked. A breakthrough happened. Think of Elijah with the servant and they're desperate for rain. And he says, go and have a look and there's going to be a cloud. And the servant goes, there was no cloud and he comes back. Imagine... Imagine if he stopped there. He said, well, there's no cloud. That means I can't do what I thought we could do. So I need another way. I need another choice. I can't change that person. It's not happening as soon as I hoped it would. So I'm going to need another choice. 
I'm misunderstood where I am. They don't get me, so I'm going to need another choice. I tried once, God. It didn't work out. Maybe you tried twice. I went again and still nothing. I went back again. God, now I'm starting to look stupid. Every time I come and I tell my friends about you, they laugh at me. They say, yeah, whatever, man. So I went again. I went again. I gave up on my family, on my friends. God, is there another chance? Is there another choice? No, there's not. Go again. As he goes and he sees the cloud, it brings rain to the land, saves lives, restores family. The power of commitment and saying to God, God, I'm committed to you. Saying to your family, I'm committed to you. It's the power of knowing that no matter what the outcome, I'm going to keep choosing you. I'm going to choose you when I feel good. I'm going to choose you when I'm feeling bad. I'm going to choose you when the good times are rolling. God, and I'm going to choose you when I feel like you're far from me. The power of commitment.